Now, Mr. Kell, just before you sit down, do you want to be sworn or would you prefer to make an affirmation? Affirmation. Yes, affirm the witness, please. This will be afternoon. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Kill. Do sit down. Thank you. I think perhaps there are some documents that you might need in the witness book, Indeed. Mr. Kell. Mr. Kell, could you please state your full name? Peter Richard Kell. Your address? Thank you. And your occupation? I'm the Deputy Chair of the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Thank you, Mr. Kell. Mr. Kell, you've made a statement for the Royal Commission dated the 12th of April 2018. That's correct. Do you have that statement there? I do. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Uh, they are, with one modification. Yes. Required. Could you explain what the modification is, please, Mr. Kell? Uh, yes. In paragraph uh, 16, in the last sentence, just to provide uh, a new date, uh, an updated uh, time for the uh, table PK3, so 28th of February. But do I understand, Mr Kell, that the final sentence of paragraph 16 should read, ASIC has prepared updated versions of those tables as at 28 February 2018, That's copies correct. of which are produced and shown to me marked PK3? That's right. Thank you. Uh, you have your original statement I there. Do. Have you hand amended that no, statement? I'll we'll do that right now. You wouldn't mind initialling the amendment, yes. Mr. Kell. You've made that and yes. initialled that change, Mr. Kell. Yes. And with that change, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Indeed, yes. I tender that statement, Commissioner. Witness statement of Mr. Kell and its exhibits. Uh, the witness statement dated 12 April 2018 will be Exhibit 2.1. Mr. Kell, did you receive a summons to attend today? I did. You have that summons I there? Do. I tender that summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.2 .2 will be summons to Mr. Kell. Mr. Kell, you've been the Deputy Chair of ASIC since 2013? Correct. And you've been a Commissioner of ASIC since 2011? Yes. Uh, what responsibilities do you have in these roles in relation to ASIC's regulation of the financial mm -hmm. advice industry? Uh, ASIC's financial advice team reports to me, as does ASIC's financial services enforcement team that uh, deals with financial advice matters. Uh, in addition to that, um, ASIC's uh, investment managers and superannuation team also uh, reports to me uh, and the credit and insurance team. Approximately how many financial advisors are there presently in Australia, Mr Kell? There are around 25,000 financial advisors uh, in Australia. Um, you can see them on the financial advisors register. And approximately how many financial services licensees are there presently in Australia? There are around 6,000 licensees. Uh, about three quarters of those are authorised to provide personal financial advice. Mr Kell, what can you tell the Commission about how the financial advice industry in Australia originally developed? The financial advice industry is a relatively new industry. It uh, emerged in a significant way in the 1980s and, and thereafter. Uh, a key part of the financial advice industry in its uh, early years and uh, one which is still important uh, has been the life insurance advice sector and the, uh, it's uh, safe to say that a uh, major part of the financial advice industry grew out of uh, life insurance agents providing advice around uh, life insurance and related products. Uh, 
um, under a uh, very much a, a sales driven model uh, with commission based remuneration. Uh, as the industry grew, uh, in part to serve a uh, growing demand for financial advice uh, as we saw superannuation balances grow, uh, you had the entry of some of the larger financial institutions into the, the sector in the, the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, several of the uh, major banks um, made uh, major acquisitions of wealth management or, or life insurance firms and established uh, major financial advice businesses in part as a result. Uh, that has been um, changing more recently. Some of those uh, uh, businesses have been sold, but it's uh, still the case that those large play, uh, those uh, large banks and uh, AMP are, are major participants in the sector. Is the financial advice industry in Australia a profession? In our six view, it is not yet a profession. Uh, there are certainly professionals within the industry, uh, but we do not view the industry as a whole as having uh, reached what would normally be regarded as the standards of a profession uh, at this point in time. And it's, I think it, you could say it's the objective of the regulator but also most of the industry participants and others that we move to a profession. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the government has recently introduced reforms aimed at raising professional standards for the industry. And why has the sector not reached yet the standards of a profession? Uh, in, in Essex's view, we would say that the uh, standards around uh, competency and the qualifications that you have to have to be a participant in the financial advice sector, uh, the ways in which advisors have been uh, remunerated in many cases and the uh, conflicts of interest that, they, uh, that that remuneration has generated between uh, advisors and licensees and uh, uh, the clients. Uh, and as you've documented this morning, uh, some of the um, conduct and consumer outcomes that have been very poor on a widespread scale indicate that uh, we're not yet at a position where we have a profession. I uh, would also note that we don't have in this sector uh, a single, if you like, dominant professional association. There are some associations which have taken a more forward-looking approach to standards, but we certainly don't have uh, a, a professional association of the sort that you get in other sectors such as uh, medicine. Mr Cal, the, the first topic that you deal with in your statement is fees for no service, which you will have heard me speak about in the opening statement this morning. Could you explain to the Commission in ASIC's view what it means for a financial services entity to charge fees for no service? Fees for no service is a term that uh, ASIC uh, came up with to describe a situation where a customer is in, uh, paying an ongoing service fee to uh, a licensee, uh, but where the service attached to that fee, most notably uh, regular advice reviews, um, the service is, is not provided. Uh, and as you've indicated, this is um, an issue that we've identifies, I, I identified as being widespread across the industry. So typically, what is a consumer supposed to receive uh, under an ongoing services arrangement with a financial advisor? You've mentioned a regular advice review. In ASIC's uh, opinion, that's the, the key service. Uh, if you have an ongoing relationship with um, an advisor, uh, you would expect, we, we believe that you would be getting uh, regular advice uh, reviews. Um, there are many different versions of the, the sorts of um, ongoing service arrangements that we've seen across different licensees. Some of them 
uh, also provide other services such as um, newsletters or, or brochures or, or other information access to, to websites and so on. Um, in our view, the key offering though is the advice from the advisor. And how do financial advisors typically charge for and receive ongoing service fees? The fees are typically deducted automatically from the customer's uh, investment account balance without the customer having to activate um, uh, the, the payment. Um, this is changing to some extent now under the future of financial advice reforms. So there is an opt-in requirement so that now, every two years, the customer must um, uh, be actively engaged around renewing the relationship if that's, uh, if that's what they wish. Uh, but uh, prior to that, there were uh, fees that could be deducted automatically over a long period of time. You mentioned in your statement some similarities between ongoing service fees and the commissions that financial advisors used to receive uh, prior to the FOFA reforms. You deal with this in paragraph 33 of your statement. Could you explain those similarities? In, in our view, if, if ongoing service fees are improperly applied, uh, then they do, unfortunately, have um, some similarities with some of the more problematic aspects of commissions, being that they are recurring, uh, they can be invisible to the customer from a practical point of view, and, and there may be no clarity around what exactly the customer is getting or supposed to get in, in return for, for these payments. If properly applied, it can be different, but if improperly applied, and that's happened on a widespread scale, they do have some distinct similarities. And what can you say about the quantum of annual service fees charged by financial advisors? Uh, the annual fee in ASIC experience uh, varies quite considerably, depending on uh, the, the licensee, but also the, the size of the uh, customer's account. It tends at the lower end to be around uh, $500 or, or so dollars. A, a more common amount would be around $2,000 on an annual basis. Uh, and we have certain, and we have seen examples where it is uh, considerably higher than that. I mean, in, um, it, it if it's charged on as a percentage of assets, it could go up to a qu uh, quite high amount, up to, for example, uh, in a small number of cases, $20,000. You're talking about on an annual basis? On an annual basis. Thank you. And when did ASIC detect that fees for no service were being charged by financial services licensees? We had a, uh, we received a breach report in August 2013 uh, from one of the large financial advice providers. Um, as a result of that, uh, it was apparent to ASIC that this may exist in other uh, entities we re and um, we re received uh, other breach reports subsequently. Um, we made a public announcement that we were looking at this in more detail in 2015 and that generated some subsequent uh, breach reports. I think it's uh, safe to say that the new FOFA requirements around opt-in and also the annual fee statement led to some financial services licensees to look more closely at what had been the practices in their businesses and that may have triggered the, the breach reports. Yes. Can you explain to me what was the content of the breach report? What was the nature of the breach as described, for example, in that first report of August 2013? Uh, it was a, that was a breach report from uh, ANZ, who have uh, uh, subsequently entered into an enforceable undertaking with ASIC, and that was that they had identified that um, across uh, their financial planning business that they had been uh, charging customers uh, a fee without providing the uh, 
annual advice that uh, the customer had been led to expect they would receive. And what provisions were identified by ANZ as having been breached by that conduct? I would have to, I, I, I haven't got that in front of me. Um, 912A is the provision um, that, uh, that ASIC has most closely looked at in respect of this conduct, but I would have to check in, in relation to that particular breach. How many entities is ASIC aware of to date uh, as ha having charged fees for no service? Uh, we are aware of eight entities. Uh, there may be multiple licensees under those entities, but, but eight financial services entities have reported breaches to us so far. Are you able to list those entities, Mr Kell? Uh, the big four banks, ANZ, uh, CBA, NAB and uh, Westpac, uh, AMP. Uh, we have also received um, reports from uh, other entities, um, uh, Yellow Brick Road, uh, First State and um, uh, I've had a sudden blank on the last one. I'll have to Oh, Bendigo, Bendigo, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, and w what did ASIC do when it became aware of the fees for no service problem? You, you talked about a public report that was released in 2015. What other conduct was ASIC involved in? We, we announced that we were undertaking a review in 2015 and we released a public report around what we'd found in 2016. Uh, that essentially had three uh, elements to it. Um, one was uh, looking at how the, the affected customers could be remediated. That was a primary focus for, for ASIC. Uh, the second was um, uh, engaging with those institutions to make sure they reviewed other parts of their businesses um, to see uh, whether there were further examples of fees being charged without a service being provided. The third element was ensuring that those entities had the systems in place to uh, avoid the risk of this sort of issue arising in the future. Um, we also have looked at uh, our enforcement options around um, this matter as well. Um, we have ongoing investigations and uh, ongoing negotiations with most of the firms around the remediation programs as well. Does ASIC have views as to why this fees for no service conduct has occurred? Uh, well, well, yes. We, I think it's uh, clear from our experience that um, the firms in question prioritised uh, fee revenue from their advice businesses over the provision of services to the clients. Uh, we found in, in all the instances that the systems that underpinned the ability to collect revenue were uh, better developed than the systems that ensured that uh, the client received uh, the advice, advice service. Uh, we'd also note that the record keeping and systems for actually tracking uh, whether the advice uh, had been provided were, were poor, uh, which meant that for many of these uh, entities it was difficult to identify that how widespread the problem was and, uh, and uh, how long it had been uh, running for. Um, the nature of the, the um, contract between the, the consumer and the licensee was sometimes unclear as well as to what service was, had actually been promised up front. And I think it's also safe to say that because of the passive nature of the payment that the fees came out automatically that many consumers did not have a good understanding of 
what was being charged and, and why, so it didn't necessarily ring the alarm bell. If I was to make a broader observation, it would be that uh, I think this is an example that we, we see a bit too often whereby the promises made to consumers up front uh, when they enter into the relationship with a financial services firm are not necessarily supported by the provision of services once they are a customer. Post-sale treatment of customers, unfortunately, does not match uh, what customers might expect up front. Has ASIC met resistance from financial services entities or their representatives in getting them to remediate customers who've been charged fees for no service? Uh, in short, yes. This, this has been at times quite a difficult process uh, around two issues in particular. One is the remediation programs uh, and the second is around uh, the nature of the reviews that are required to establish whether there has been further charging of fees for no service. So we've ended up having at times uh, reasonably vigorous debates around the, the scope of, of the reviews and how many licensees should be included. We had discussions with some firms that wanted to suggest that a remediation program where consumers had to actively opt in to get remediation was appropriate, whereas in our six view, given the, the passive nature of uh, many of these fees, that, were, that was not the right way to go. Arguments about the length of the program, uh, whether um, the and whether a mere offer to conduct an annual review to the client was, uh, even if that wasn't uh, taken up or the client couldn't be contacted, whether that was sufficient to allow the fee to be charged. All of those issues and 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 more, frankly, are have been um, at times in dispute. What regulatory action can ASIC take in respect of fees for no service? Uh, ASIC has, under or has obtained two enforceable undertakings. Um, they relate to the licensee's obligations under 912A to act um, efficiently, honestly and uh, fairly. Um, those, that is, in a sense, the, the primary uh, obligation that we're, we're looking to here. I would note that um, uh, in relation to some of the provisions in the ASIC Act that go to, say, misleading and deceptive or false and misleading conduct that, that uh, uh, some of the formal disclosure documents are exempt from those provisions, so that's not necessarily a straightforward path for us. Um, we do have some other investigations underway, but th that is the primary obligation that we're looking to. The 912A obligation yes. and yes. an enforceable undertaking has been the only regulatory mechanism that you've invoked so far in relation to fees for no service? Yes. We do not have, uh, at this point in time, a, a straightforward ability to require a remediation program of the sort that we think is, is in many cases, uh, desirable. That's a power that we have indicated in the current enforcement review of ASIC, ASIC's powers that would be uh, uh, sig of significant benefit um, under the, um, the, the area of having a directions power for ASIC. So at the moment we, we don't have a directions power that would allow us to more easily impose a remediation program of the sort that we think would, would have been appropriate in these instances. So is it the case then that uh, a remediation program is an outcome that can only be achieved if the entity agrees to implement a remediation program such as as a condition of an enforceable undertaking with ASIC? Uh, it's, um, that's, we do not have a straightforward ability to, to obtain um, a remediation program uh, especially one that's very broad based and one um, where we think uh, uh, there are issues around 
the focus on customer outcomes as being the driver for the remediation program. So there are no uh, remediation terms in the uh, uh, additional licence conditions imposed in respect of CFPL and uh, uh, the other CBA entity? Uh, there is a remediation program there, again, but the imposed details... A, imposed as a, an additional condition of its licence? Yes, that's, that's correct, uh, Commissioner. Um, again, the ability to impose a remediation program with uh, some of the details that we think would be desirable is not, not as straightforward as we would like. I, I just want to be sure I understand that, Mr. Hill, because you've used that expression, I think, at least twice now, mm. that it's not a straightforward way of doing things. Is there some complicated way that this could be done that ASIC has chosen not to pursue? Uh, we are of the view that if we had the appropriate directions power, that would provide us with a better ability to set out what the remediation program should look like, who it should cover, the time frames, so on and so forth. Yes, but is there something else apart from the power that you don't yet have, uh, the direction power that you could utilise to secure remediation for customers of these entities? Uh, the info we could take, uh, as we've said, um, we seek a declaration by taking 912A action. It doesn't have a penalty related to it, and we could uh, look, I think, to take uh, to, to seek such orders. But that has not been typically a straightforward way of obtaining remediation in the past. I see. Right, Mr. Kell, the, the second topic that you deal with in your statement is financial advice that's inappropriate. Just before we come to that, Ms. Orr, can I just go back to a couple of matters you raised, Mr. Mm. Kell? Are you able to give any indication, uh, broad or more precise, of uh, whether uh, ASIC was able to identify the proportion of clients? Uh, who had been charged without provision of a service? Was it that some clients had been charged but no service, all clients had been charged but no service, or there was more likely somewhere in between? Uh, and can you give me some estimate of how many or what proportion? Uh, I don't have those figures in front of me, Commissioner. We did undertake a project uh, in around about 2014 that looked at the percentage of clients that might be described as passive, that is, that were not receiving advice on a regular basis uh, across different entities, and I would be happy to provide that to the Commission. That doesn't necessarily indicate that all those clients were being charged fees for no service, but it would give you an indication across different licensees about who is not receiving regular advice. You uh, spoke of, um, my note is unduly truncated, but you spoke of uh, firms making promises up front which were not supported by uh, post-sale treatment. Now, that's a very tangentious description, I think, of uh, a rather longer answer you gave. Uh, three radically different kinds of case, I think. Selling what you can't deliver, selling what you won't deliver, and selling what you don't deliver. Now, uh, like any summary of that kind, uh, those phrases might have a catchy appeal to them and they probably don't convey enough nuance in them. Mm. Selling what you can't deliver, selling what you won't deliver, selling what you don't deliver. Do you have any response to uh, any of those phrases in this context or connection? I would... Um, I, th I think they're 
it's a good way to capture <laughs> the, uh, the issue, Commissioner. Well, I would take you nowhere. You've got yeah. to answer the question, Mr. Uh, I would say, in this instance, uh, the don't deliver would characterise the majority of the cases that uh, we're talking about, um, with uh, some of, uh, it would appear, some of the, the can't deliver perhaps being mixed in there as well. But th this, this issue is one where I think there is more of a, uh, a service where you don't deliver rather than won't. Selling what you can't deliver might raise issues about uh, application of the law that are rather yes. different from uh, either of the other two categories, I would have thought. But those are matters that perhaps we'll look at. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Ms Orr. No, I was going to move to inappropriate advice, if yes. that's convenient, Commissioner. Uh, and I, I was saying, Mr Kell, that you've described inappropriate advice in your statement as inappropriate advice in the sense that it fails to take into account the client's circumstances or doesn't comply with the best interest duty and related obligations in the Corporations Act. That's in paragraph 43 of your statement. In ASIC's view, how much of the financial advice being provided in the industry is inappropriate in that sense that you've described in paragraph 43? It's, uh, it's difficult to land on an exact percentage. Uh, ASIC doesn't um, look at all the advice provided right across the financial advice sector, and for fairly obvious reasons, we, we tend to focus on those areas where we think there may be higher risk of poor quality advice. So it's, uh, it's difficult to, to generalise. We have undertaken some reviews in, in recent times uh, that have looked, amongst other things, at um, uh, advice, uh, including its comply whether it complies with the best interest duty and related uh, obligations, uh, one in relation to uh, advice around um, superannuation through the large vertically integrated firms. Uh, we found there uh, that when we looked at the files, so upon a file review, that uh, around three quarters, 75 per cent of the uh, files did not demonstrate compliance with the best interests duty and related obligations. More recently, we've done a survey of uh, advice around uh, establishing self-managed super funds. Uh, we've found there, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, an even higher rate of um, advice that doesn't comply with the um, best interest duty when assessed by looking at the files of around uh, nine in ten pieces of advice. Sorry, nine in ten, 90 per cent. Yes. yes. So the, the first figure you gave, Mr Kell, of 75 per cent, uh, that came, did it, from the work that was published by ASIC in January this year in relation to uh, vertically integrated institutions and conflicts of interest? That's right, that's right. And, and that work was directed to reviewing uh, files, um, uh, files for licensees controlled by AMP, ANZ, CBA, NAB and Westpac? Yes. And the, the second figure that you gave, the 9 in 10 figure, uh, do I understand that that relates to work that ASIC has done which has not yet been published uh, in relation to self-managed superannuation funds? Uh, that's, that's correct and across a much wider range of licensees and advice firms. Yes, yeah, so in attachment A of your statement you refer to that work being uh, review work done by an independent expert across 137 different licensees. Is that mm. right? That's correct. And from that work, uh, you say that ASIC has concluded that nine out of ten client files didn't demonstrate compliance with the best interests duty and other associated obligations in the Corporations Act. That's, 
Correct. That's, that's a, a very high figure, of course, Mr Kell. What, what does ASIC make of that, that 90-odd percent of the files examined in that recent review did not demonstrate compliance with a critical duty in the Corporations Act for financial advisers, the best interest duty? Well, it is obviously very uh, disappointing, to say the least. Uh, I should note that for the majority of those files, there is no necessary indication that that uh, immediately uh, signals consumer detriment. There's a, a smaller percentage where we think um, consumer detriment is, is apparent. Um, but uh, what we have found um, uh, across large and small licensees in our reviews of recent times is that the industry as a whole is, is struggling to get to grips with how best to implement the key best interest duty requirements, including how they are documented in, uh, in the advice files. And it's not simply, I want to emphasise it's not simply just a matter of record keeping. Uh, if, for example, there are disputes between a, a client and an advisor or a licensee down the track, then um, ensuring that the reasons why the client received the advice that they did is, is on file and all set out is, is critical. Uh, and ASIC has certainly been signalling for some time now that licensees need to improve their record keeping and their documentation. Does it create problems for remediation if remediation is necessary uh, that these files have not been kept in a way that records those matters? Uh, that's, uh, that can certainly be the case. Um, that, that has been the case with remediation programs in the past, that they're more difficult to implement if required if the record keeping is, is poor. I might say it primarily has arisen in both of those examples around two, two issues as well, uh, around um, whether the advisor adequately takes into um, account uh, the value or nature of the financial product that the client is currently in, vis-a-vis -vis the one that they may be moved into or switched into, and secondly, uh, whether the advisor adequately takes into account uh, the um, objectives and needs of the client and their particular circumstances. What particular types of inappropriate financial advice does ASIC regard as most prevalent currently? Well, ac across uh, a number of areas, you have um, advice where consumers are switched out of their current product into a new product without any, um, it appears, reasonable basis upon which, which to do so. That, that often involves superannuation. As we've just mentioned, uh, advice to establish uh, an SMSF, uh, particularly where a client has, for example, a, a lower balance uh, or may not understand the obligations that attach to being an SMSF trustee. Uh, we've also seen uh, regular advice around life insurance where um, the switch into the new insurance would substantially erode the superannuation balance if it's paid for out of super or may uh, result in pre-existing conditions creating problems for the customer. Uh, <coughs> we've seen uh, advice around uh, a one-size-fits-all type of model, which has been discussed earlier this morning, but again, where clients, irrespective of their financial circumstances, get placed into a very, very similar uh, strategy. Um, and advice, again, particularly in the SMSF context, where people are being encouraged to uh, undertake borrowing to invest in, in real property. So there, they are some examples. And what does ASIC regard as the principal causes of inappropriate advice? Uh, there are 
a number of causes. Um, conflicts of interest that are not uh, either avoided or, or appropriately managed. Um, one of the other key reasons that we see again and again is, is inadequate monitoring and supervision by licensees of their advisors, um, uh, including um, poor audit processes that don't pick up uh, poor advice early enough. Uh, there is still the issue. You say early enough, poor advice, pick up poor advice before it's acted on. And once the advice is acted on, uh, you know, the horse is out of the stable, isn't it? Uh, either before it's acted on or given the long-term nature of some of this advice, it might be picking up poor advice before the harm manifests itself which can be some time down the track. But yes, uh, the earlier the, the better, Commissioner. But it's not always the case that the detriment occurs immediately. One of the challenges is that it may not be for several years um, that before you, uh, the harm occurs. The archetypical case I had in mind was switching. Yes. Uh, if, if a switch is done, uh, then the horse really has left the stable, hasn't it? Or uh, is it possible to unwind the transaction? It, it can be particularly difficult in the life insurance situation to unwind, that's for sure. Uh, in some cases in, in the investment situation, there, there ought to be more opportunity to consider it, but um, uh, uh, it, it will vary. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get a grip on um, at what point, in effect, the supervision uh, task, uh, if carried out differently, might uh, intercept okay. uh, bad outcomes. The, That's uh, what I'm trying to gra yeah. grapple with. The, the, other, the other way of looking at it uh, is that if um, an advisor provides one or two uh, instances of poor advice to a client, it's better to pick it up then before the same advisor has provided to 25 yes. instances of, of poor advice. So it's, it's pro it, it may well be that, and, and you can see that that's where some of the most significant failings have occurred. Yes, thank you. Were there any other matters that you wanted to refer oh, to, Mr. Um, in relation to the causes of inappropriate advice? Well, I, I think it's, it's generally accepted that the levels of competence and professionalism uh, need to be improved in the industry and we would see that as contributing to, to poor quality advice. And then on the demand side, if you like, the, the nature of uh, financial products and financial advice means that it's, it's often difficult for the consumer to understand the full implications of of the advice and and thereby to, to put pressure on uh, themselves. So this is not an industry where <coughs> um, consumers themselves are always best placed to drive uh, widespread um, uh, higher quality outcomes. In your statement, you state ASIC's view that a substantial proportion of inappropriate advice is likely to cause detriment to customers. You make that statement at paragraph 66 mm -hmm. of your statement, um, and you give some examples that illustrate the potential consequences of inappropriate advice in paragraph 68 onwards. Could you explain uh, one or two of those examples for the Commission, examples of inappropriate advice resulting in detriment for customers? Certainly. Uh, I'll seek to give the uh, abridged version, but uh, uh, an example that we see, I think unfortunately t too regularly, involves life insurance advice, where the advice results in insurance that uh, is uh, in some cases simply unaffordable, but that also substantially erodes uh, 
the client's superannuation balance because it's paid for out of superannuation. So one example we saw was an advisor providing risk insurance and superannuation advice to a, a couple whose combined income was around $200,000. This is the example in paragraph 71. Uh, they were paying uh, for their existing insurances around uh, $3,400 per, <coughs> per annum, around that mark, um, and they had uh, around $185,000 together in, in various super accounts. The advisor recommended they switch uh, into new insurance products and increase their cover uh, so that the premium uh, would now be more than $55,000. So it went from $3,400 uh, $3, to around to more than $55,000, which obviously represents more than a quarter of their gross income. $33,000 of that was to be paid out of their superannuation account. Uh, and the impact of that would be that their superannuation accounts would be dramatically eroded in the case of the wife would, would go into the negative after, uh, after a, a year. Uh, the annual cost of the insurances was also significantly greater than the annual amount they were contributing to super, so 35% greater in the case of the husband, 223% greater than the wife's annual superannuation guarantee uh, contribution. Uh, I might say we did end up banning the advisor in uh, that case um, in relation to that piece of advice, but also other advice that he provided. Did the advisor gain financially through commissions for that advice? Uh, yes. Uh, while I do not have the exact figure on me, the advisor would have received a very substantial upfront uh, commission for insurance at, at that level. And how did ASIC detect that incident? Uh, that was um, as a result of ASIC, um, uh, ASIC surveillance into an authorised uh, representative um, in, uh, that we took across uh, parts of the sector in 2014 and 2015. Uh, is, is there any other example that you'd like to give? You've uh, provided a few in sure. this part of your statement about... Well, the, the, the other on a, a different issue involves the establishment of an SNSF, um, as we've, we will document in our upcoming report. Uh, we saw an example where a client obtained advice to establish an SNSF um, in order to invest in a property in, in Queensland. Uh, it was a townhouse uh, worth $400,000. Um, uh, the consumer found that the costs of managing the property, the costs of administration of the SNSF were, were much greater than uh, he had been uh, led to believe that he had anticipated. So um, he is presently trying to, if you like, unwind the situation to sell the townhouse, which is not going to be possible for the um, price uh, for the purchase price, around $22,000 less, uh, and overall the loss to him is in the order of $70,000. And what has happened, if anything, to the advisor who provided that advice? Uh, the, in relation to the recent MSF, SMSF project, uh, we are still looking at appropriate action against advisors who provided inappropriate advice. What could you uh, say about the relationship between financial literacy on the part of consumers and the provision of inappropriate advice? Uh, <coughs> advisors, oh, well, sorry, um, consumers in, in, in one sense go to an advisor because they don't necessarily have the financial literacy or experience or skills to, to understand the ins and outs of financial products and appropriate financial strategies. So the fact that they've gone to an advisor uh, generally indicates that 
they are looking for help to understand and navigate the financial system. So while our aim is uh, at ASIC is to help equip consumers to make better decisions, in this instance it's how they can best choose the right advisor rather than doing it all themselves. The fact that they've gone to an advisor indicates that they need to be able to trust someone to help them navigate uh, their own financial strategy and uh, in many cases where they're going to be in retirement. You've referred earlier in your evidence to the various teams within ASIC that you are responsible for in connection with the mm. regulation of financial advice. Uh, across the 25,000 financial advisors operating in Australia at the moment, how many staff does ASIC have involved in regulating their conduct? Uh, our financial advisors team, um, in part as a result of some uh, recent additional uh, government funding, has, uh, has around 60 uh, members of that team. Um, we also um, have, uh, within our financial services enforcement team, staff who will come in or, in or out of financial advice matters uh, as required. So the core team of 60 and uh, then depending on how many matters are on foot there may be another 10 or 20 or more that come through with um, the financial services enforcement team. I'm not sure exactly how many from our enforcement team at the moment are working on financial advice matters on how, but we can provide that. But, but that is the extent of the number of people in ASIC engaged in regulation of the financial advice industry? Um, Broadly speaking, that's uh, correct, yes. There may be others in, who work on financial advice in our financial capability team, but that's, that's the core team, is, is 60 people. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr Kell, the third topic that you deal with in your statement is conflicted remuneration. Yes. Could you explain to the Commission what conflicted remuneration is? Uh, yes, it, it refers to... Um, uh, a benefit, it can be a monetary or a non-monetary uh, benefit given to, given to a licensee or advisor um, that could be reasonably expected to, to influence the financial product advice that is given or the financial product uh, that is recommended. And could you explain in brief terms the recent reforms in relation to conflicted remuneration? Uh, under the future of financial advice reforms, um, there have been significant uh, prohibitions against conflict, conflicted remuneration, um, commissions and volume bonuses as they apply to uh, investment products going forward. Um, existing remuneration arrangements were, were grandfathered, so to speak, at the time that um, uh, FAFA was introduced. Uh, there have also been some more recent reforms around uh, life insurance advice. Conflicted remuneration is, is still allowed, but um, the scale of that remuneration uh, has been reduced. Starting from 1 January this year, it will be on a, a path down to a maximum of 60% upfront commission and volume um, uh, payments have also been uh, removed from uh, the life insurance sector. You've mentioned life insurance. What are the other uh, most common financial products or financial services that continue to be excluded from the ban on conflicted remuneration? Uh, general insurance products. Um, such as you know, car insurance or home insurance, um, um, basic banking products, uh, timeshare, uh, timeshare products, uh, so-called execution-only services, um, as long as there hasn't been a, an, ex uh, an established relationship with the, the client or advice hasn't been provided in the previous 12 months. Um, Certain uh, 
non-monetary benefits such as training and education or IT software and support um, uh, and benefits arising from uh, related non-financial products of which direct property is a notable example. Does ASIC have a view on whether any or all of these exclusions from conflicted remuneration are appropriate? Well, our, our starting point is that any conflicted remuneration has the capacity to create the wrong incentives, um, which can, can lead to inappropriate advice. So it, it certainly has to be carefully managed. Uh, we have, I think, um, made our views clear that the conflicted remuneration that was available in the life insurance sector until recently was contributing to, to poor advice, uh, hence the recent reforms, and the government has asked ASIC to review the impact of these reforms in a few years' time uh, to see whether um, they show improvements in the quality of advice, so that's in some senses still an open question. Um, we also are of the view that uh, commissions in relation to timeshare products where there have been long-standing concerns about high pressure selling and misleading conduct uh, are inappropriate. You mentioned the grandfathering provisions in the regime. <clears throat> Under the grandfathering provisions, arrangements that are entered into before the 1st of July 2013 that provide for conflicted remuneration can continue, is that right? Yes. And you mention in your statement that they continue with no statutory end date. That's correct. So uh, there is no time frame within which the grandfathering provisions will cease? That's correct. And does ASIC have any view about that? Uh, <sighs> We do have concerns that the grandfathering provisions can incentivise the wrong sort of behaviour. They can encourage advisers to retain clients in products which enjoy grandfathered remuneration, even in circumstances where they may um, more appropriately be moved to uh, other products as their needs change um, over time. It's not an area where we've undertaken any recent sort of extensive work to establish how heavily uh, different licensees are relying on grandfathered remuneration. So I'm, I'm not sure I could give you an answer that goes to wh exactly what sort of problems it's crea creating. Uh, but um, it is an area that we intend to review. To what extent does ASIC think that the conflicted remuneration reforms have been successful in achieving their purposes? Well, we certainly have uh, been, uh, or we've supported the introduction of the conflicted remuneration uh, reforms uh, and in assessing, well, sorry, stepping back a bit, it's, it's not necessarily straightforward to assess the impact of the conflicted remuneration reforms um, when you consider that there have been a lot of other reforms coming in at around the same time. So it's uh, disentangling the effect of those reforms from, say, the opt-in requirement or the fee disclosure statement or others is, is not straightforward. Nonetheless, we would observe that we have seen a decline in the sale of certain um, uh, widespread, higher risk, problematic products such as agricultural investment schemes, such as uh, higher risk retail structured products or um, uh, leveraged um, investment strategies. Um, and that, in our view, has been positive. It's, it's difficult, to, and it's difficult to see how, for example, those agricultural investment schemes would have been sold on such a widespread basis without generous upfront commissions. Another topic that you deal with in your statement, Mr Kelly's conflicts of interest. 
and you say in your statement that the financial advice industry has historically been plagued by the prejudicial impact of conflicts of interest. That's paragraph 210 of your statement. Mm -hmm. And an area of concern to ASIC, you say in your statement, in relation to conflicts of interest, is advice businesses which also involve themselves in the provision of financial products, either of their own manufacture or on a white label basis. Is that right? Correct. Could you explain uh, the nature of those concerns? <coughs> ASIC, uh, I, well, vertically integrated businesses, which is the, the phrase that I think is used to describe uh, the, the sorts of business models that you're talking about, um, in our view, have an inherent conflict and you do see these models uh, across the financial advice and financial services sector in, in, the, in the largest entities but also beyond that. There is inherently uh, a conflict between manufacturing a product and supplying a product but then having an advice network or advisors who are uh, supposed to be providing advice in the best interests of the clients, putting the clients, uh, or prioritising the interests of the clients. Uh, so doing both within the same firm is uh, allowed under the regime, but it does produce a conflict that uh, needs to be appropriately managed. You say at paragraph 216 of your statement that the conflict between the interests of the licensee and the interests of the customer is most significant when the licensee decides which products to include on its approved product list and the advisor decides which products to recommend to an individual customer. Can you explain to the Commission <coughs> how approved product lists work and any concerns that ASIC has in relation to the use of approved product lists? <coughs> many, many licensees will have so-called approved product lists. That is a a list of uh, products, be they investment products or uh, um, uh, life insurance, for example, that an advisor is allowed to recommend. Um, at one level, this can be a useful way of ensuring that only an appropriate set of products is considered by uh, an advisor. Uh, but if that approved product list is, is very narrow and only includes uh, products related to uh, the licensee, then it may not ultimately um, ensure that the client gets the, the, best, uh, the best product. So uh, there is also an issue about how products get onto the APL. Uh, and whether there is a consistent process applying both to products related to the firm and external, external products. Having said that, and this is why the second part of that formulation is important, you can have a broad-based approved product list, but if um, the advisor is still, through various ways, ending up <coughs> recommending a very narrow set of products, and only in-house products to the individual customer, then that itself may not be appropriate uh, either. So it's the interaction between the two um, may s result in uh, conflicts not being managed appropriately. What did ASIC's report 562, uh, published earlier this year, identify in relation to the impacts of this vertically integrated model in five of Australia's major banking and financial services institutions? Uh, report 562 found that um, there was, uh, in most instances, a reasonably broad range of uh, products, in fact, in most cases, in, uh, a majority of products on the APL were uh, external products. Um, uh, however, the products the, in, that were recommended to clients 
were, on average, in the majority of cases, internal in-house products. Uh, so that, to sum it up, is, is what we found uh, around the way in which um, internal products were recommended versus external products. The second part of that project looked at the quality of advice, uh, especially as it applied to recommendations for a client to switch into a new superannuation product. And that's where we found that uh, around 75% of the files that we reviewed didn't uh, demonstrate compliance with the best interest duty and, and with uh, perhaps more worrying in the immediate term, 10% of files uh, indicated um, a significant risk of detriment in the short term. Thank you, Mr Kell. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you. Now, does uh, any party other who has leave to appear other than uh, Council for ASIC seek leave to cross-examine Mr Kell? No? Mr Steele? No. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr Kell, may I raise one matter with you? I think sure. you may have given your personal address when you uh, uh, commenced your evidence. Uh, it occurs to me that may present a problem. No. Sorry. Um, Perhaps if I could ask that that be suppressed. Uh, I think hitherto we have not given personal addresses of office holders, and I don't think we should start by making an exception for you, Mr. No. Kell. I'll uh, uh, thank you. Commissioner. Make a non-publication direction, which I'll execute at lunch. But uh, if I could just uh, say to the media present that although uh, his uh, personal address was given, there will be a non-publication direction in respect of that personal address. I'll yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kell. Uh, you may step down. Thank you. Zor. Commissioner, Mr Kell's evidence touched on vertical integration, which is a topic that has recently attracted significant interest in the financial advice industry. And the Commissioner heard evidence uh, from Mr Kell about Report 562, which dealt with vertically integrated institutions and conflicts of interest in the financial advice industry. We asked AMP, ANZ, CBA, NAB and Westpac to provide us with statements addressing some or all of three topics connected with vertical integration in the financial advice industry. The first topic was approved product lists and we asked the entities about the processes that they have in place for selecting products for inclusion on their approved product lists and for deciding whether to allow their financial advisors to recommend financial products that are not on their approved product lists. We also ask the entities about how they manage conflicts of interest in connection with their approved product lists. The second topic was conflicted remuneration. As you've heard, since the 1st of July 2013, the FOFA reforms prohibit financial services licensees from providing and financial advisors from receiving benefits that could reasonably be expected to influence the choice of financial product recommended by an advisor or to influence the advice given to clients by an advisor. As you've also heard, the prohibition on conflicted remuneration is subject to certain exceptions. We asked the entities about the benefits they've provided to financial advisors since the ban on prohibited conflicted remuneration and the processes they have in place to ensure that they do not provide prohibited conflicted remuneration. The third topic was white label products. A white label product is a generic financial product, like a managed fund, a platform or a superannuation fund, that the product issuer makes available to other companies to sell under their own branding. We asked the entities whether they create white label products and about the fees that they receive in relation to those products. We will tender each of the statements that we receive from the entities about these topics and summarise some key aspects of those statements. We start with ANZ, which provided one statement dealing with all three topics. The statement was provided by Mr Donald Siller, who is the head of sales for ANZ Wealth. In relation to approved product lists, 
Mr Siller explained that ANZ maintains a master approved product list for each product type and that each of ANZ's licensees maintains its own approved product list. He described the process by which ANZ decides whether to include products in an approved product list or remove them from the list, which involves internal research that is considered by a number of forums and committees. Mr Silla also explained the process for deciding whether to grant approval for advisers to recommend products that are not on an approved product list. This process has three stages, reflecting the different circumstances in which an advisor might seek such approval. Mr Silla told the Commission about the proportion of in-house products on ANZ's approved product lists. He said that in 2017, 27 per cent of the products on the approved product list for ANZ financial planning were in-house financial products. Mr Silla did not provide information about the proportion of funds invested in or insurance premiums paid in respect of in-house products. In relation to conflicted remuneration, Mr Silla said that he had been informed by the heads of each of the ten entities associated with ANZ that to the best of their knowledge, since the 1st of July 2013, none of these entities had provided any prohibited conflicted remuneration. Mr Silla did not provide any details about the permitted conflicted remuneration provided by any of these entities. Mr Silla also said that he was informed that since the 1st of July 2013, ANZ and its licensees had not identified any instances of an employed financial advisor or authorised representative receiving prohibited conflicted remuneration. In relation to white label products, Mr Silla told the Commission that since 1 July 2013, no entity associated with ANZ has made available any new white label products. However, he noted that there are a number of white label products that entities related to ANZ have continued to make available after that time. These products were generally administration services or wrap accounts. In relation to each of these products, customers paid fees directly to the product issuer and the product issuer paid a distributor or promoter fee to the intermediary. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Mr Donald Silla, S-I-L-L-A-R, dated 11 April 2018. That will be Exhibit 2.3. We turn to AMP. AMP also provided one statement dealing with all three topics. This statement was provided by Mr Bradley Green, who is the Director of <coughs> Advice and Research at AMP. In relation to approved product lists, Mr Green explained that AMP's licensees have approved product lists and explained the process by which decisions are made about including products on those lists. He also referred to AMP's policies that govern the management of conflicts of interest in connection with the composition of approved product lists. AMP said that they would provide a spreadsheet setting out the proportion of in-house products and the proportion of funds invested in in-house products. This spreadsheet was not provided to the Commission until after 9.30 last night, and we have not in the time available be been able to review that. In relation Can I ask when it was asked to be provided by? Yes, I'll, I'll find that date and uh, we can... We'll tell you that date in a moment, Commissioner. Both the request and the due date. Thank you. In relation to conflicted remuneration, Mr Green did not provide information about the kinds of permitted conflicted remuner remuneration provided by AMP's licensees, but Mr Green explained the steps that ANZ takes to ensure that its advisers do not receive... Hey, I think. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Mr Green? Mr Green, I'm the sorry. AMP? Yes. Yes. Mr Green explained the steps that AMP takes. I'm sorry if I confuse things there, to ensure that its advisers don't receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. He said that these include training its advisers and in relation to recent changes in the law in relation to life insurance commissions, 
requiring advisers to attest that they do not receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. However, despite these steps, Mr Green identified a number of instances where AMP's licensees have provided prohibited <coughs> conflicted remuneration since 1 July 2013. These included, in 2014, AMP waived power planning fees in relation to 913 customers worth approximately $411,000, where the advisor recommended that the customers transfer a sum invested in an external product into a product on AMP's approved product list. Between January and September 2015, AMP waived power planning fees worth approximately $352,000 in relation to a further 856 customers in the same circumstances. In 2015, AMP waived power planning fees totalling $17,780 in certain instances where customers transferred out of an external superannuation product into an AMP product. Between April and August 2015, AMP passed on approximately $10,600 in product commissions paid by an external provider to its advisers. And between 2013 and 2017, one AMP advisor received approximately $25,879 in asset-based fees, some part of which was asset-based fees on borrowed amounts. AMP did not disclose any of these events in any of the three submissions to the Commission that it made earlier this year, despite each of these events constituting a breach of the Corporations Act. In relation to white label products, Mr Green said that neither AMP nor any entity associated with AMP manufactures products that are made available to an intermediary to sell under its own branding. I'll tender the statement of Mr Green, dated 12 April 2018. Exhibit 2.4. And in response to your question, Commissioner, about the timing, the request to AMP was sent on Wednesday, the 28th of March, uh, seeking the statement and the exhibits by Tuesday, the 3rd of April. An extension was granted at AMP's request to Wednesday, the 4th of April. Uh, the statement was provided in its final form uh, on the 12th of April and the spreadsheet provided, as the Commissioner has heard, uh, late last night. Yes. We turn to CBA, Commissioner. CBA provided three statements. The first was provided by Mr Hugh Humphrey, who is the General Manager of Bank Financial Planning at CBA. This statement deals with the topic of conflicted remuneration in relation to Commonwealth Financial Planning and BW Financial Advice. Mr Humphrey told the Commission that since 1 July 2013, the only benefits that Commonwealth Financial Planning and BW Financial Advice have provided to financial advisers that could reasonably be expected to influence their advice were payments of commission in relation to insurance. Mr Humphrey said that in some cases these payments were shared directly with advisers and in other cases they contributed to increasing the advisers' variable remuneration. Mr Humphrey also explained the measures that Commonwealth Financial Planning and BW Financial Advice have taken to ensure that their advisers do not receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. These measures include training for advisers and the analysis of payments received from product providers to identify particular types of prohibited conflicted remuneration. <coughs> I tender the statement of Mr Hugh Humphrey, dated 13 April 2018. Exhibit 2.5. The second CBA statement was provided by Mr Mark Ballantine, who is the General Manager of Financial Wisdom and CFP Pathways. This statement deals with the topic of conflicted remuneration in relation to financial wisdom, CFP Pathways and Count Financial. 
Mr Ballantine told the Commission that both Count Financial and Financial Wisdom provide a number of different types of permitted conflicted remuneration to financial advisers. They pass on insurance commissions as well as fees and commissions that are subject to the grandfathering arrangements that accompanied the FOFA reforms. Mr Ballantyne also explained the measures that Count Financial and Financial Wisdom have taken to ensure that their advisers don't receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. However, Mr Ballantyne identified instances where, despite these measures, Count Financial and Financial Wisdom advisers have received prohibited conflicted remuneration. These included seven cases where Financial Wisdom advisers received non-monetary <coughs> benefits in excess of the $300 threshold, an unspecified number of instances where Count Financial and Financial Wisdom advisers received payments from superannuation account product issuers in 2014 and 15, and an unspecified number of instances where Count Financial and Financial Wisdom advisers received brokerage payments. Mr Ballantyne also specifically excluded from his statement instances where Count Financial or Financial Wisdom paid prohibited conflicted remuneration. So it is not clear whether there have been further contraventions by either of those entities. I tender the statement of Mr Mark Ballantyne, dated 13 April 2018. Exhibit 2.6. The third CBA statement was provided by Ms Linda Elkins, who is the Executive General Manager of Colonial First State. This statement deals with the topic of CBA's white label products. Ms Elkins said that since 1 July 2013, two members of the CBA group, Colonial First State Investments and Avantios Investments, have manufactured products that have been made available to intermediaries, which Ms Elkins refers to as promoters, to sell under their own branding. These products include platforms and managed accounts. Where Avantios makes products available to a promoter, it generally pays the promoter certain fees. However, it does not pay fees to promoters that provide financial advice in respect of any accounts opened after 1 July 2014. I tender the statement of Ms Linda Elkins, dated 13 April 2018. 2.7. We turn to NAB. NAB provided two statements. The first statement was from Mr Ross Barnwell, who is a general manager in NAB's advice business. This statement deals with the topics of NAB's approved product lists and with conflicted remuneration. In relation to approved product lists, Mr Barnwell told the Commission that decisions about including products on NAB's approved product list are made by an internal committee after considering research undertaken by 360 a division of NAB's Consumer Banking and Wealth Division. Mr Barnwell described the matters that the committee considers in deciding whether to include products on the list and the processes that NAB adopts for managing conflicts of interest in relation to that decision-making process. Mr Barnwell also described NAB's processes for granting waivers to allow advisers to recommend products that are not on NAB's approved product list. Mr Barnwell provided some information about the composition of NAB's approved product list. He explained that as at 1 January last year, 38.26 per cent of the products on NAB's approved product list were in-house products, that is, a product issued by an entity associated with NAB. He also explained that in the period from 1 January last year to 31 March last year, the proportion of funds invested in or insurance premiums paid in respect of in-house products as opposed to external products by new clients of NAB was 66.39 per cent. In relation to conflicted remuneration, Mr Barnwell told the Commission about the steps that NAB takes to ensure that its advisers do not receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. 
These measures mostly involved providing training and guidance to its advisers about conflicted remuneration. Mr Barnwell noted that NAB recently introduced a working group with responsibility for reviewing and designing controls to prevent advisers from receiving conflicted remuneration. Mr Barnwell said that in each year since 2013, NAB and its associated licensees have paid hundreds of millions of dollars, in some years in excess of half a billion dollars, in permitted conflicted remuneration. However, Mr Barnwell acknowledged that there have also been a number of instances where NAB has provided or NAB advisers have received benefits that were prohibited conflicted remuneration. These included between 1 J July 2013 and 25 May 2017, entities associated with NAB provided non-monetary benefits in the form of free support services to financial advisers who recommended particular NAB products. From 1 July 2013 to the present, NAB and its associated entities have paid referral partners under its introducer program and other referral arrangements to refer potential loans, potential loan customers to NAB. Where these fees were paid to financial advisers, they might reasonably have been expected to influence the advice provided. Mr Barnwell said that NAB was investigating this issue, that its investigation is ongoing and that NAB has suspended the ability for financial advisers to establish new broker relationships under the Introducer Program and other referral arrangements. Also, between 1 July 2013 and 17 March 2017, NAB and its associated entities provided non-monetary benefits with a total value of over $500,000 to advisers in contravention of the conflicted remuneration provisions. NAB did not disclose any of these events of prohibited conflicted remuneration to the Commission in the two submissions it provided earlier this year, despite each of them constituting a breach of the Corporations Act. I tendered the statement of Mr Ross Barnwell, dated 13 April 2018. Exhibit 2.8. The second NAB statement was provided by Mr Matthew Lawrence, L-A-W-R-A-N-C-E, who is the Executive General Manager of Wealth and CEO of MLC Super in the Consumer Products and Services Division at NAB. This statement deals with NAB's white label products. Mr Lawrence said that since 1 July 2013, Associated entities of NAB and its subsidiary, GWM Advisor Services, have manufactured products that are made available to intermediaries to sell under their own branding. These have included superannuation products, investor-directed portfolio services, managed investment schemes and a transactional cash account. Many of these products have since been terminated and for each of these products, clients paid fees directly to the product issuer. The product issuer generally paid fees to the intermediary for its role in promoting and distributing the product. I tendered the statement of Mr Matthew Lawrence, dated 15 April 2018. Exhibit 2.9. Uh, finally, Westpac provided two statements. The first was a statement from Mr Michael Wright, who is the national head of BT Financial Advice. Mr Wright's statement deals with the topic of conflicted remuneration. Mr Wright described the steps that Westpac took to ensure that its financial advisers would not receive prohibited conflicted remuneration. One of the measures that Westpac takes is to generate a banned commissions report, which identifies payments that have been received from product providers. These payments are classified as either banned or permitted and only permitted payments are passed on to financial advisers. Mr Wright explained that in each year since 2013, Westpac has paid around $200 million in payments that constitute permitted conflicted remuneration. However, Mr Wright acknowledged that since 1 July 2013, 
there have been a number of instances where Westpac has provided or Westpac advisers have received benefits that constitute prohibited conflicted remuneration. These included $24,844 in payments received under a brokerage referral arrangement between 1 July 2013 and 5 May 2015, approximately $64,745 in percentage-based advisor fees paid to dealer groups before December 2014, $61,000 in volume-based payments made to AMP after 1 July 2014, $23,000 in advisor commissions deducted from customer accounts between 1 July 2013 and 29 August 2013, $27,895 in commissions that were paid in relation to superannuation accounts between 1 July 2013 and 14 July 2016, and $20,800 in commissions paid in relation to the Asgard platform in August and September 2014. Westpac disclosed some, but not all, of these events in its submissions to the Commission earlier this year. I tender the statement of Mr Michael Wright dated 16 April 2018. Exhibit 2.10. The second Westpac statement was provided by Ms Constantina Kotsopoulos, who is the Head of Platforms Product Management for BT Financial Group. This statement deals with the topic of white label products produced by Westpac. Ms Kotsopoulos said that since 1 July 2013, Westpac has made three platforms available as white label products to be sold under the branding of certain dealer groups. Any fees payable by clients in relation to these products are paid to product issuers, which are subsidiaries of BT Financial Group. Under arrangements that were entered into before 1 July 2013, the product issuers remit a proportion of those fees to the dealer groups, but only where those fees were paid by clients who entered into the product before 1 July 2014. That is because those payments continue to be permitted under the grandfathering arrangements that accompanied the FOFA reforms. I tender the statement of Ms Constantina Kotsopoulos, dated 16 April 2018. Exhibit 2.11. Commissioner, if that is a convenient time, after lunch we will turn to the first case study. Yes, 2pm. Thank you. 2pm.